marketing or senior product specialist from Exit Scientific. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm basically in charge of the Singapore site for Azure Biosystem. So I'm from Exo Scientific. We are also the official distributor uh, in Singapore. So Singapore customers, if you have any questions, free, please feel free to ask in the chat box or you can email me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ting Ting. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Sorry. Okay, uh, just sorry, just a little housekeeping before we get started. There will be a chat icon and Q&A icon in the webinar platform. Chat icon is for you to, you can say hello here or report a problem for the webinar. But the Q&A icon, use this icon whenever you want to ask any question to the speaker in written. And another one is the format to ask question is insert your country, your institute name, before you ask your questions, for example, my USM, then your name and you're followed with your question. So now without further, now without further ado, we will turn the time over to Ms. Tan Kai Leng, the regional field application scientist from Azure Biosystem. I will let her to take over the section from now onwards. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. So before I start, I would like to do uh, just some mic check. Uh, can you hear my voice clearly? And can you see the slide, PowerPoint slide shared on the screen? Please let me know. You can type yes in the chat box so I know everything runs well for you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for your feedback. So let us start the presentation of the day. Um, hi everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Kailing, the Regional Field Application Scientist of Azure Biosystems. In today's webinar, the topic will be Azure Imaging System 600. The depth that we're going to will be the technology evolution in chemiluminescence and fluorescent Western blot imaging. This is a Zoo Imaging System 600, is a gel dot and chemi dot. And today's webinar is a is collaboration between a Zoo Bell Systems, Excel Scientific, and also Epical Scientific. So Excel Scientific is from Singapore and Epical Scientific from Malaysia. That's why our MC just now said that if you have any question, you might need to address your country origin so we can answer your question. Okay, right. So before we start, let me introduce Azure Biosystems to you. We're a United States-based company. So we're a team of highly experienced scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs dedicated to accelerating of science. So in our office is it at California, Dublin. That's where we produce all our products. Our products combine smart and simple workflows with high performance and affordability. So you can have the confidence in your data to move on quickly and the flexible capabilities to go whenever the data brings you. Just some brief introduction to the leadership of the company. This is our uh, CEO, Arno Shifji, a venture investor. If you look at his portfolio, you can see that he invested in a lot of innovative companies. And we have uh, Executive Vice President of R&D, Dr. Deeping Che. So if you look at his past experience, he has a uh, doing R&D in Alpha Innotech and Illumina. Alpha Innotech, if you've been doing Western blot, uh, I think you should be quite familiar with this uh, brand, Alpha Innotech. It's, this is a timeline, the development of our company. So the company founded in 2013. All our core members are coming from Alpha Innotech. And of course now, it, the, the brand become protein simple. And one year after the company founded, we developed our first imaging system for Western blot. We call it C-series, but now we have the new and 
improved version, we call it a zoo imaging system, which is the star of our presentation today. And of course, we have other products in the company portfolio. We have Sapphire Biomolecular Imager, which is the industry first hybrid CCD imager and laser scanning system, which is still and our best and highest spec in the company uh, portfolio. And of course, we also have a, a Zoo Cielo real-time PCR system to complement protein expression data. Right, so we Azuba systems have a range of gel system, reagent and consumables, and also imaging systems for your Western blotting needs. Here we have like Azuba Aqua Gel Tank, Total Stain Cube for total protein staining, transfer buffer, pre-cut PVD membrane, and also ECL substrate. So these two are the imaging systems that are highlight of our uh, imaging system in our company, Sapphire Biomolecular Imager, and also Azure Imaging System 600 models. So let us go straight to the agenda of the day. The first will be optimal detection of chemiluminescent signals. Then next we'll go to excitation light sources in fluorescent western blot imaging. And why we say that fluorescent western blot meets the stringent publication requirement and how this imaging system delivers research solution with reliability and flexibility. So let me introduce a zoo imaging system to you. This is a zoo imaging system 600 model. It is the highest model of a zoo imaging system so far. You can see that we have other models. All of these are upgradable, but today we are picking up the highest spec of all, which is a zoo imaging system 600 models that are capable of doing chemiluminescence or Western imaging. Uh, this is an imaging system that allows you to do imaging application without any compromises. So in this system, you have dual UV, okay, and uh, allows you to visualize the safe dye uh, signals and then chromacy gel and so on and so forth. And of course, in Western blood imaging context, it will be, it allows us to be, uh, capture the signal from chemiluminescence blood and also fluorescence blood. If you look at this, we, we have a few light sources in the system. Uh, one no, the notable one will be in particular the RGB and near infrared fluorescence, where we do utilize two types of excitation light sources. This part I will explain it in the second session. We're talking about technology evolution here. So the first thing you have to notice is in if you look at the spec of this system, Azure Imaging System 600, if you look at the camera specification, this is, it contained 9.1 megapixel camera. It has 16 bits, it says, it gives you 16 bits resolution at uh, 65,000 gray scale. So this camera itself, it basically can uh, collect or accuracy all the images and signals from your gel, from gel, DNA gel, RNA gel, Western block covering, both chemiluminescent and fluorescent Western, and even color metric Western as well. So this is how it looks like in terms of chemiluminescent Westerns and fluorescent Westerns. Before we go into the camera itself, so camera in these principles of optical imaging is a very simple, simple diagram to show the principles. We have, you have a sample, the sample can be anything, in this context will be plot, your Western blot, you need to have excitation light sources, and also you need to have a detection or detector to collect the signal. In the in the context of chemiluminescent signals, it doesn't need any excitation light source because the sample will emit light due to the chemical reactions on the sample. So now we focus on the detector. CCD camera, or call it CCD detector, is what's the detector used in these Azure Imaging System 600 models. A CCD can capture the entire field of view simultaneously, and where user can control integration time, choice of long and short exposure based on the application. Till today, CCD detector is still the best detector for chemiluminescent signals because, because it can capture in a field, the total field of view. It's still ideal for luminescence and white light imaging signals that varies across the time, for example, chemiluminescent signals, and where you can set it at a certain exposure time. So you can set it up to 60 minutes exposure time. Simultaneous light detection in a big area allows you to capture the entire image of a gel, a protein gel, DNA gel, 
even 3D objects. Of course, CCD camera itself, it has its own limitation, where it has a low quantum efficiency at a longer wavelength, like longer than 800 nanometer wavelength. It has better than film, dynamic range is better than film, but it's still limited. And the spatial resolution is heavily dependent on the resolutions that you have in the camera. You might be wondering why I point the 16 bits and uh, resolution over here. So in these 600 models, the camera itself can produce digital data with up to 16 bits resolution, giving you uh, that has 65,000 gray cell step kind of depth. So if you look at this, this is the very basic properties of digital imaging. The differences in bit will tell you how many uh, details that you can, you can see from an image. So you can see that the, the, gray, the, increase, the higher the bit, the gray cell or the, the gray level or the bit depth is greatly increases. This will give you a lot more details Okay, and the ability to accurately represent a greater signal uh, dynamic range. In this, in these 600 models, a zoo imaging system 600 is using 16 bit resolution camera. 16 bit is considered a very sophisticated camera in this sense. Here, you will give you the, the resolution allows you to display the image at a greater latitude that is possible than 8-bit or 12-bit images. Therefore, you have better signal-to-noise ratio and way wider linear dynamic range, right? So how it interprets into data is the it allows you to accurately depict the expression the chemiluminescent signals expression or any other signals expression. Right, so now it brings us to dynamic range. Dynamic range is also quite important in terms of the detection technology. What does it really mean? And is, does it, is there any difference between the CCD chips or not? So obviously it is. So the size of the CCD means how many electrons they, uh, can one pixel hold in a single well. So we always talk about dynamic range. What uh, the dynamic range, what it means is the ability of the camera to record simultaneously very low light signal alongside with a very bright signal. There, here we have two CCD chips. Okay, one definitely have a higher pixel well cap. So what happened if we you have a very bright signal of the same blood and very low at the same time? The brighter one, okay will be tend to saturate the pixel. So as you know, when you capture the chemiluminescent or any Western blood images, when the point, the point when you start to see saturation point in the image, you cannot use the image for any data analysis because the signal, the pixel, the pixel itself, it doesn't represent the true data anymore. So what we say is when the charge in the pixel exceeds the saturation level, the camera starts to deviate from this linear response means a signal, signal to uh, related to the uh, expression level or the amount, hence it compromises the quantitative performance of the camera. So you, if you have the capability, you should look for CCD chips that has a bigger pixel well cap. Therefore, it give, can capture more light before cast saturation, therefore give you way better dynamic range. Okay, so that is a part for detector detector technology or detection technology. Next, we need to move on to excitation light sources. In the context of for us, uh, Western blot, chemiluminescent, it doesn't need any excitation light sources, but fluorescent, yes, you definitely need excitation light sources to excite the fluorochrome. So now we are talking about the part of excitation light sources, right? This system allows you to do RGB and near infrared fluorescence imaging. Okay, if you look at the configurations here, we have two laser excitation light sources for the near infrared channels and the LED for the RGB channels. So you can see all the dyes that are compatible with this pairing of excitation light sources and the filter emission, the emission filter, sorry, and where you can do safe dye and total protein normal uh, staining imaging. Okay, here let us look at the frozen configuration in Azure Imaging System 600 models. Like I said, RGB allows you to capture RGB signals 
the RGB signals will be excited through the LED excitation light sources and the near infrared will be excited through the laser excitation light sources. And even though we have five excitation light sources for the fluorescent application, it doesn't mean that you can need to you 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 can do up to five channel detection simultaneously. What we recommend is four channel because as you can see, the the red and the near infrared 680 is too near to each other. There's a high possibility of crosstalk. So if you want to do fluorescent multiplex western blot, we always uh, recommend you do either uh, red, green, blue plus the uh, 784 or the combination either one except the pairing of these two red channels. Right. Let us look at the evolution of fluorescence excitation, excitation light sources. The reason why Azure Imaging System 600 models is using the combination of LED and laser excitation light sources can be explained by looking at this figure. Laser, it gives you superior excitation light quality with minimal light leakage when compared to white light and LED. So what it means by higher, uh, what it means by light leakage? Light leakage means it gives you background noises because it is overlapped with the emission wavelength, right? So LED in this sense is still ideal for RGB because of they are distinctly apart from each other, the spectral separation. But for near infrared, it would be better if we have used a laser excitation light sources to separate them apart. So all in all, of course, laser is uh, the quality is is still the best. It's the give you the best quality, clean background. Uh, better quali image quality and detect very subtle expression changes, but of course it comes with a very uh, premium price. We do also notice that with the laser, lasers in the op is the optimal near infrared fluorescent excitation light sources. When you want to uh, look at the the bands at this around these uh, wavelengths, so here we have the same plot where we image under the LED excitation light sources and also the uh, the laser excitation light sources. You can see there's a clear dif uh, clear differences in terms of the background noises. Of course, the cleaner it is, it's easier for you to do the analysis. Therefore, we, we opt for laser excitation light sources to differentiate the near infrared fluorescent signals. And next also, there's an issue in terms of laser versus LED for near infrared crosstalk issue. So in the context of accurate quantitation for fluorescent western, okay, uh, let me give you an example uh, or, the, or a scenario. When researchers opt for fluorescent western, they want to go for the ultimate quantitation power. Means they want to, they do not want to have all the, all the hassles and limitation from the chemiluminescent of western. They want to do multiplexing without worry. Therefore, you need to have a combination of the candy bodies on the same block. They so the important part will be the antibody detection, which is the dye that you use. The dye that you use also need to be able to separate them from each other, so you don't have a cross sort that will give you a false positive result. So we have this is basically a known issue where the uh, the choice of the excitation light sources will give you, of course, a possibility of cross talk, especially in the near infrared channels. Here we have a fluorescent western blot with only the infrared 680 secondary antibody staining on with tag with the protein of interest. If it image under the 680 channels, both laser and LED excitation light source will give you very good signals. But the differences is when you when you image the blot under infrared 800 channels. You will see this. Uh, this is what we call cross talk in when you image it under LED excitation light sources. So this will be a problem or you should be careful about if you're using these two dyes or you're doing near infrared fluorescent western to detect, let's say, a total protein and phosphorylated protein, let's say. Because the cross out from the LED excitation light source will make it very difficult to quantitate the expression accurately later. Okay, next thing, uh, let us move to the part that why we say fluorescent western blot meets the stringent publication requirement. In the context of western blot imaging, a part of the very uh, the generic color metric that is used on field, a very basic one, the two common antibody detection in western blot will be chemiluminescence and fluorescence. Chemiluminescence is widely used. Of course, we're still using it until today. 
And but there's a there's a I'll say known there's a few known issues of these uh common luminescent signals or westerns in the context of quantitative western blot. If you look at the band, the protein abundance on your blot, if you have blot a protein bands that is highly expressed and lowly expressed, you will notice that the moment you put your ECO substrate, the signal will change across the time. This is what we call as dynamic rate of reaction. Why is because these the light the signals can, are coming from chemical reaction, and as you, you know, chemical reaction they are affected by a lot of factors. For example, time, ambient temperature, the as um, whether it is is in dark or not, and the concentration of the substrate, and even pH dependent. So the ratio of signal between the low, medium, and highly expressed protein on the blot are not constant across the exposure time. So the, the why this would be an issue because this dynamic rate of reaction will give you, it's not a linear relationship, means the signal really is not linear to the protein amount that you want to look for. So therefore, it's not a full range linear proportionality. At, and because of that, we always say that, we always say the chemiluminescence uh, Western are uh, at most or at best semi-quantitative. It's not full quantitative, but it's semi-quantitative. Fluorescence, on the other hand, because there's no enzymatic amplification of the signals, is constant. Because the only way to change the fluorescence uh, signal, uh, signal or the intensity of the signals, there's only two, uh, two factors. The first factor will be the light input or the excitation light sources, the intensity, the heat on the sample, on heating the chloroform. And the second part will be how much chloroform on the sample. So there's only two factors affecting fluorescent signals. And as you know, in the imaging system, the input or intensity of excitation light sources, the fluorescent excitation light sources, are basically constant. So the only thing would change the fluorescent signal intensity will only be the amount of the fluorocom tag on your protein of interest. Therefore, fluorescence is the ultimate quantitative western that you want to go for, especially if you want to quantitate minute differences between, let's say, protein. Protein A and protein B. Frozen signals is proportional to the target and it has static rate of light generation and also allows you to do multiplex reaction. And additionally, on the chemiluminescent versus fluorescence over here, in terms of publication requirement and the data integrity, chemiluminescent itself, like I say, is because it's chemical reaction, is heavily affected by the substrate concentration, enzyme quantity, and so on and so forth. If you're doing your ECL uh, ECL or chemiluminescent resin, you do notice that when you use a different ECL substrate, it gives you different type of results, like the high more in high intensity or lower intensity, or sometimes it may be easily get oversaturated or overexposed. So because these ECL substrates, they have their own optimal range of detection. So this is what we call a signal, signal linearity. The amount of signal intensity should be proportional, directly proportional to the amount of protein load in your sample. So you need to be careful when you use the ECL substrate. Once it falls out, the signal falls out of the signal linearity, it is not longer representing the true protein amount that you're looking for. So there is always a risk of losing the signal linearity when you do chemiluminescent westerns. And this is also a comparison between, this here is a comparison between the chemiluminescent and fluorescent signals uh, done by a paper published in 2015, where it says that the increasing amount of the lysate, you will see increasing amount of the signals, the directly proportional will be the fluorescent. Uh, signals. Before we move into why we say that fluorescence western meets the stringent requir publication requirement, we have to understand that why researcher has uh, opting to do fluorescent western. 
So Chemi Luminescence Western Lysate has been here for many, many years and will still be using it for the, I would say, for the next 30 to 40 years because due to the nature of its kinetic and enzymatic reaction, it can greatly amplify the signal. Therefore, it's very good in detecting low abundance protein, one protein at a time, okay? And it's very good in detecting presence or absence of a protein, which is what we call qualitative question. But it has its own flaw because of the great intensity, high amplification, it easily saturated in high abundance protein, and the reaction time limited by the substrate quality. And like I say, it is best semi-quantitative, the benefits of the fluorescence western has completely outweighed chemiluminescence, except the part of the sensitivity, because you can do multiplex detection on the same blood. We and it's especially important if you want to do quantitative western, like I say, when you want to accurately quantitate minute differences between groups and samples, and where you can fulfill the requirement to have a same loading control on the same blood, because you don't need to cut them up at, anymore. And this is all due to the spectral separation nature of the fluorescent signals. Therefore, you can image them all on the same plot, giving you multiplex capability, cost efficiency, and also the most important part is direct correlation between the signal intensity and the protein abundance. Now, I have you give you a very brief idea why fluorescence is outweighed of uh, chemiluminescence western in, in such a way. But how does it matter when we do want to submit a paper? If you notice, I believe we, some of you might have experienced it right now, that we are having reproducibility issues where you're looking for, let's say you refer or citing certain puppy uh, research findings that you, you look for and uh, that support your research findings. And there's been a lot of uh, people talking about this, why most of the published research findings are false. I would say 75 to 90% of them are not able to reproduce in your own lab. And the, the worst case is you might not able to reproduce your own data, maybe a year later or two years later, or even when you change the other lab. So there is reproducibility issues in terms of scientific findings. Therefore, in 2014, the NIH in the United States, they have a joint workshop with Nature Publishing Groups and Science to address and identify the common issue that will give you, that will form the principle and guidelines for reporting preclinical research findings. And of course, it doesn't only cover Western blood, it covers a lot more microscopic um, images and so forth. But in this context, we're talking about Western blot imaging. Let us look at how Nature Publishing Group deal with this. So if you look at their portfolio, at the part at the page that image integrity and standard, under plot, you will see that they strongly discourage quantitative comparison between samples on different plot. So you by uh, you should be able to squeeze all your sample within the same plot as much as possible and they say loading control must be run on the same plot as well and you have to if you crop the gel or crop the membrane you have to mark it clearly and then state it in the figure legend or in your manuscript and journal of biological chemistry uh, take more advanced stage in this state they do say that in the presentation and quantitation of Western blot, let me enlarge here, they stated the issue of housekeeping protein, where the problem of this approach is the linear relationship between the signal intensity and the mass or volume of the sample load that must be confirmed for every single antigen. And therefore, they recommend to do total protein staining unless there's a clear demonstration of the uh, housekeeping protein expression is unaffected by experimental treatment. Of course, there's a lot more on how to present your Western blot images. If you if we look in deep into the blot images on quantification, uh, I'll say guidelines in submitting to their journal, you will see that they do state how you should present your data. And all in all, they will say 
no should be a you should normalize the signal intensity to total protein loading whenever possible and if you want to use whole signal protein they shouldn't be normalized without evidence that manipulation doesn't affect uh, expression frontier science news also published this blog uh, i'll say news uh, last year july that they take a look at the western blot image cropping here is an example of an acceptable Western blot membrane cropping. What I want to tell you is nowadays when you want to submit Western blot image, like uh, Western blot data, the public, the journal or editor will usually ask you to submit whole blot image to verify that the, the data that you analyze and the representative images are uh, taken from the true, the blot, the blot that you do. Okay, so therefore it's quite difficult if you want to cut, if you if you want to capture blot that is from, uh, that is cut up in a, diff um, a lot of strips. And this is because we are doing chemiluminescent western. So in this case, fluorescent western will be very handy because you don't need to cut the blot up anymore. And not only that, in terms of quantitative travel for chemiluminescence, there has been an issue on what well, the intensity of the membrane stripping and repro process will have, have to give you the risk of losing your total protein. So the membrane stripping and repro, this is very important because when you cannot separate two protein of interest by the means of gel electrophoresis, they are at a similar molecular way. The only way for you to detect them one and another is by stripping one antibody down after you image it and then, then prop another the second antibody and then do your imaging so this also gives you a risk uh, this risking you in terms of total protein loss you can check it out on from, from this publication and how does it affect your total protein intensity so in this sense why we say that fluorescent western meets the stringent publication requirement because first and most important thing is you preserve whole blood image whenever you capture your western blood that's the first and foremost thing so there's no more very troublesome and hassle archive of your data and losing your data because of that or amateur postgrad student who doesn't know how to capture uh, preserve the data accurately and the important part is your loading control and your protein interest let's say they are basically on the same image. So you can compare bands on the same broad without cutting them up. There's no more strip and repro process, therefore giving risking you losing the total protein and also your protein of interest that you worry that the expression might not reflect the true amount anymore. And of course, the youth, when people opt for fluorescent western, they're always opt for total protein normalization because there's no need to prove the housekeeping protein signal linearity anymore. And therefore, in all in all, fluorescent western it improves the reproducibility and gives you way better western plot quantitation and saves you a lot of problem. Yeah, so that's part why we uh, we stress on and address that fluorescent western meet stringent publication requirement and why in the higher spec of a zoo imaging system which is 600 models we focus on the frost and western because this will be the next the not i'll say it will be the next this is the next normal for western blood imaging of course total protein normalization will be also the next normality in the normalization uh, control because very simple total protein is you staining more protein Okay, the total protein versus one housekeeping protein. So this by the number itself is already outweighed. The, the benefit has already outweighed the housekeeping protein uh, normalization. And of course, because it's staining total protein, your tech, the, there's more, more bands versus one band. You have reduction in terms of the technical and also biological variation and even loading control. So here, this is what we will see in the next few years in terms of uh, western blood image and you can see the quantitation power the highest quantitation power that you can get will be fluorescence detection with total protein stain then the second one will be fluorescence detection with housekeeping normalization and next will be chemiluminescent detection but normalized with total protein 
Okay, let us move on to how an imaging system that will give you research solution. So we'll talk about the, the technology behind it, the detector camera, the CCD camera, the 16-bit resolution, the excitation light sources that especially the process to all your basic lab bench needs. You also must not forget this is also a gel dot, a gel dot, a chemi dot, a fluorescent resin block dot as well. So you can see the, the application that you can do on this system, the basic DNA or RNA gel imaging, Western blot with color marker merging feature, fluorescent Western, and of course, in gel fluorescence, fluorescent gel, I'll say this is called fluorescent gel, called messy blue, and also autophorous fossil for any organism, bioluminescence bacteria, okay, and also bioluminescence or tech, uh, plant and also a preliminary screening on mouse brain section and also in vivo in terms of the mouse with a tumor. This will be more for preliminary study and uh, screening before you move on to higher resolution or magnification to do the analysis and, and interpretation. Of course, it's not only limited to, to our basic uh, but, uh, I'll say lab application. Anything that has that be captured can be captured by the CCD detector, as long as it emit, uh, can be excited by all the excitation light sources in the machine, regardless like chromacy, chlorophyll, or even fluorescence signals from the organism or anything, and even the glass light that is stained with fluorescence uh, dyes, you can image them in this system. So these are the images from our lab and also from our user as well. So next, let us look at how this machine has been produced a data for publication. Of course, these are just some of the representative data. We have a lot of publication, especially this year from Nature, uh, where they use the, the system to do commercial protein gel imaging. Chemiluminescent Western blot imaging, can you see? You can see obviously over here, even though the signal is very, very faint from our naked eyes, it still can quantify it due to the CCD camera that is 16 bits resolution. And of course, fluorescent Western blot imaging, this will be the near infrared fluorescent Western blot imaging. You can see that how they present the data, the data will be presented in a grayscale because this is the easier way to. In, uh, to visualize the intensity of the signal. Also, that's from science, and of course, more from cell press, and also nature immunology for chemiluminous cell Western blood imaging, and commerce and more. So, of course, gel dot, those are will not uh, those are basic, so I will not be mentioned over here. Not only that, we have application notes available for you if you want to see how a system allows you to do any kind of application. Therefore, we have application note here that where we tested uh, the Lonza reag uh, reagents, showing that the, this imaging system allows you to do all kinds, of, not say all kinds, of most of the stain for DNA gel on the market because of the very, 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 uh, flexibility and variability in terms of excitation light sources. And also we have DNA dye detection limit using tester with our system. And of course, Free color Western blot that show the, the housekeeping protein and increasing uh, protein load. And of course, why we say that fluorescent Western blot will be the next normal, especially when you want to do or if you're doing phosphor related protein detection versus total protein detection, because they cannot be separated by the means of gel electrophoresis. So here you don't need to cut the blot into two uh, or strip and reprobe. That's it. You just to image it under two channels, including a housekeeping or total protein will be three channels or three color multiplex fluorescent Western blot. And of course, the, the imaging system 600 models and also been, we have extended this to image viral load in chicken embryo. You can see here that the, the system been used to image this and give you a really preliminary study or image of representative images to showcase how in, in the overall review, how your data will be look like in, in this uh, uh, big field of view. And there it is, uh, this is how we have talked about uh, how 
uh, to optimally detect chemiluminescence signals and excitation light sources in fluorescent western blot imaging. Why fluorescent western blot meets the stringent publication requirement and how an imaging system will give you research solution with its own reliability and flexibility. Thank you, everyone. So I think that's a wrap. Thank you, okay. everyone, for coming. Okay, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this webinar. Please contact Mr. CK for Malaysia and Ms. Ting Ting for Singapore if any more information needed. Kindly support for our upcoming webinar. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone.